Welcome back to the Falling Walls Breakthrough Conversations. In this format, which is realized in partnership with the Federal Ministry of Research and Education and Springer Nature, we have created a unique space for close interaction and exchange with leading scientists, researchers, innovators, and entrepreneurs. We invite you, our virtual audience, to engage in this discussion. My name is Aline Lücken, and I'm a senior editor at Nature Communications, the flagship open access journal of the Nature Portfolio. It's now my honor uh, to introduce uh, Marina Vazovska um, here to Berlin. Uh, she is a full professor of mathematics and chair of number theory at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. And she recently won the Fields Medal for her work on sphere packing in eight and 24 dimensions. Welcome. Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> sure. Uh, before we delve into what you currently do for your research, uh, we would like to know what sparked your interest in mathematics. Was it always your favorite subject in school or how did that develop? Yeah, so I guess my story is boring. It just I, mathematics was my favorite subject at school. And uh, after finishing middle school, I went to a high school which is specialized in physics and mathematics. And uh, when I finished high school, I decided to study mathematics at the university. And from studying mathematics at the university, I decided to do also, also a master and PhD in mathematics and became a research mathematician. So <laughs> maybe a straightforward story. <laughs> Seems like it. Did you have any role models along the way? Maybe not, not that much. I, I think uh, yeah, my, my, my actually early, my early years, I did not realized that being a researcher in mathematics is a, an option for, for a profession. So this was something what I learned on the way. And uh, I guess my, my school teachers, my university teachers, so those were people I learned from, I was inspired from, I don't know, maybe great mathematicians of the, <laughs> of, of, of the past, uh, mathematicians who write uh, especially for those right popular books books for wide audience so probably those those, those people great um, could you explain in simple words the breakthrough that you presented here at falling walls uh, so um, so he, here i will speak about sphere packing uh, problem but not only maybe in my talk i will not focus so much on like technical mathematical details because usual talk in mathematics it's like for last for an hour and here <laughs> i have 15 minutes and uh, yes but i hope i will be able to explain what is mathematical research on on example of my own work and uh, yes yeah, so to try to also make it entertaining and interesting even for people who are not mathematicians and uh, maybe don't want to go into fine details of proofs and definitions. So could you try to explain that, um, just providing a little more detail? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm a, a mathematician and I, uh, I'm a number theorist and uh, my favorite part of mathematics is uh, solving uh, geometric optimization problems, but not the ones which come from uh, real life, but rather idealized and nice ones. And uh, so one of the Examples of such a problem is a sphere packing problem. And so this is what I'm going to speak about uh, in my uh, lecture. So the, uh, the geometric question is rather simple. So we have a big container, we have a huge supply of equal uh, like balls, perfect balls, and we'd like to know how many balls can be put into that uh, container. And this is a geometric optimization problem, and it turns out that it is actually a very difficult geometric optimization problem. And uh, so my work is not about three-dimensional balls, it is about balls in higher dimension, for example, in dimensions 8 and 24. And in my, my ambitious goal for this lecture is also to explain a little bit what are these other dimensions, what are higher dimensions, and uh, why should somebody care about them. <laughs> Exactly on that point, I think most of us can imagine sphere packing in three dimensions, right? Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. so hard. But how do you imagine those higher dimensions? Actually, I don't. 
But maybe that's the trick. I don't imagine them because mathematics gives us a f abstract formal way to describe them. And I just follow the, uh, this definition and navig navigate myself by abstract reasoning. So at least that, that's my, my approach to this. So. Okay. So um, as I mentioned in the introduction and you just said as well, um, you've contributed work on solving this problem in eight and 24 dimensions. To, so does that mean in all the other dimensions, the problem remains to be solved? Yes, and for, as for today, this problem is solved in dimensions 1, 2, 3, 8, and 24. And all other dimensions are open. I think uh, probably to a lot of us, it would be interesting to know about the process of deriving these solutions. Would you describe it as a creative process? Do we need to imagine you sitting in front of your computer all day? Or do you write formulas with pencil and paper? Just a bit more insight into the process. Would be yeah, so I, I think mathematics, uh, finding solutions to unknown mathematical problems, it is a creative uh, process. And uh, here it maybe reminds a little bit uh, how students work on their mathematical homework. So you already know some methods, you apply them. If they don't work, you use other ones. And a lot of time it's actually working with a paper and, uh, and pen. Uh, and uh, a, lo a lot of time it is doing uh, computer computations whenever I can come up with some uh, say numerical experiment which might help me to uh, understand things which I cannot imagine. Uh, then it's useful to check those computations on a, on a computer. And uh, the final stage when solution is uh, ready, so one has to write down a paper and paper it should be like an essay which explains mathematical ideas. And so this is also a, but that's usually the, the final step part part of the work. And uh, at least for me, in, in this pro problem problem solving uh, process, also a lot of ideas they somehow don't survive. They go to the paper bin. <laughs> and, uh, <yeah. laughs> So do most mathematicians nowadays also have computational expertise then? Mm. Yeah, so I think it's it really depends. So, of, of course, once we have this possibility, it's useful to make experiments, but maybe, I guess there are some areas where, where this is not very helpful yet, but uh, I'm trying to come up with an area where people don't do com uh, computer computations at all, and I'm having hard, hard time imagining that. So I, th I think... Uh, nowadays, uh, people do try to uh, some, because somehow uh, it's, uh, uh, it's really a hard time to, to, to imagine people who do not do any uh, c computations by, by by computer. So pro pro probably such areas still exist, but I think there are, I guess, few few, few of them. <laughs> it seems like. Could you speak a bit more about the implications and the applications of your research? Yes, all right, right. It's a research in pure math, and right now the application is the new mathematics itself. And also somehow this optimization problem, which I solve, I think what is uh, pra practically might be important is knowing these good configurations. But my work is not about finding good configurations. It's about proving that they cannot possibly be improved. And so this is maybe, it's, it's, it's indeed a theoretical uh, work. What I hope can be useful are all the methods I had to develop on the way to solving this problem. For example, as a part of the solution, I had to construct new types of uh, functions so that the functions and that simultaneously their Fourier transforms have very specific shape. And I hope that this might be uh, useful in signal uh, processing, for example. Right. In your uh, career, you've already worked with researchers from Ukraine, from Germany, from the United States, and many other countries. Would you say that mathematics is sort of a universal language that can unite people from different countries that really facilitates cooperation? Yes, I, I do believe that mathematics is universal and uh, 
transcultural, so it's at the same time, it's uh, it certainly can unite mathematicians from all over the world, but uh, some, sometimes I think of mathematicians as maybe like a small tribe of people distributed all over the, uh, the, the earth. And uh, unfortunately, there are also people who are somehow resistant to mathematical <laughs> ideas. And uh, yeah, maybe that's an, another wall to break. Ah, interesting. Um. <laughs> um, something else I wanted to ask about so even though dis the disparity is not quite as extreme but women are still minorities in the field of mathematics do you feel like this affected your career in some way? I don't think it affected me personally but uh, at the same time I think it's important to have more women in our field and to uh, and I hope that we are on the right uh, way to, to, to this goal. So, for example, our department in uh, EPFL, I think it's a good example of an department where the number of uh, female professors is uh, r relatively high and uh, keep, keeps growing. So I hope that this is the right way to go and uh, yeah, so that also we will meet 50 years from now and we will not ask that question. Hopefully, um, maybe Going along those same lines, how have you seen the role of women change in the past 10 years and what are you hoping for in the next 10 years to come? Yeah, so maybe it's a bit difficult for me to analyze last 10 years because maybe uh, my perspective on the field has uh, changed because 10 years ago I was a student, a PhD student. I was <laughs> so I think PhD student uh, or just yes. yeah, so now now probably I see, I also see the like uh, for example academia from other uh, side and maybe if you ask me, me ten years from now I will have better idea of how how uh, thing, things happen and uh, yeah but at the same time I don't I don't think that the role of women change maybe I hope that the number of women who participate. Uh, will uh, will change and maybe there will be more women on leadership uh, positions but uh, the role as it is probably it, I hope it will not change and after all universities they're usually very conservative structures and maybe it's also a bit of a good thing about <laughs> about them mm. um you can already look back on a very impressive career. As I mentioned in the introduction, you've won the Fields Medal. Would you describe that as the um, sort of highlight of your career so far? Or are there other moments that stand out to you? Yes, okay, maybe there are two things. As one of the, I, th I think that really uh, like the best part of a career of a scientist are scientific discoveries. And uh, but then prizes, that's of course a recognition that's also very important. And uh, yes, yeah, so I was very happy when I could find the solution of the sphere, sphere packing problem. It was certainly like a big, like a, like a treasure that I was able to find. So, and of course, I hope that there will be more of them uh, to come. Great. Um, those are all the questions from my side. Um, so I'd like to thank you once again for coming and spending some time here with us and answering these questions. Um, of course, all the best to you for the rest of your career, very promising career to come. And to all of our online viewers, you can please stay on the line and our next breakthrough conversation will begin in about five minutes. <laughs>